Thank you for listening to Life Improvement Radio. You are listening to a rebroadcast of a previously recorded show. We're live. The Miami Book Fair, powered by Life Improvement Radio. Tolter, on Network for more information. Twitter, Tolter, Neil S. Haley, Facebook, LinkedIn, Neil Haley, Instagram, Tolter, Pinterest, Neil Haley, Google Plus, Neil Haley, and also at Periscope, at Total Tutor. And uh, enjoying the conversation, having a blast with such uh, very, very interesting authors. So I want to welcome the program my co-host, Eric Remmel from Life and Further Radio. Eric, again, it rolls on, and quickly before we know it, it'll be 2 o'clock, and let the hard work begin for you in uh, producing all of these interviews, putting them into individual podcasts, and then also playing them on Life and Further Radio. How are yeah. you? Yeah, good. I just have one question for you. What social media platform are you not on? <laughs> oh yeah, see, uh, that's uh, I'm becoming an expert in social media, Eric. I guess because I'm a self promoter in so many ways. I, I'm sure you love the self promotion I give you. I mean, I promote others so well as well as I'm promoting you and our relationship, knowing each other for so long, and uh, how we met through uh, uh, a syndicator, and how we become great friends and. And, and, and we just, and every year when November comes up, it's time for the Mind Book Fair. So I'm excited now to welcome the program author, Jacinda Townsend. She is the author of Sing Monkey. Jacinda, how are you? And thanks for calling. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're, you're very, very welcome. And uh, are you enjoying the Mind Book Fair so far? Oh, this is fabulous. I've seen so many fabulous writers, and the, the tents are outside. And, I, you know, when I landed the plane, uh, when I landed at the airport, it was raining, but there were fireworks going on. And this is kind of like how the book fair has been, right? So it's so wonderful to see all these people coming out um, to, to book against the weather. And, and I'm loving this, loving it. Super exciting. You didn't have to travel far for the fair, did you? From uh, Indianapolis. Oh, not too bad. I'm sure the weather, even though it's rainy, it might be a little bit more enjoyable here. <laughs> I left big lots of snow, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely much better a little bit. <laughs> yes, yes. So, the so Midwest, also- Midwest got hit pretty bad, didn't it, Jacinda? If we didn't get in Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh didn't get anything yet, knock on wood, but you got oh. that. Don't say it, did, yeah. Oh, good for you guys. Good for you. I mean, it's <laughs> awfully late in the year for this, so I uh, shouldn't complain. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we've had a mild uh, fall, to say the least. I'm happy about that, Getting le- leading into winter, for sure. Now, Jacinda, tell us a little bit about your background, then we'll get into your, into your book. Sure. I grew up in uh, Kentucky, in south-central Kentucky, and um, just, you know, it, it, much like the girls in my book grew up in a rural area, um, I remember... You know, my big hobby was to go out in this cornfield and and watch the plane go over. Um, And then I moved. When I was 16, I left, and I went to Harvard. And then I stayed on the East Coast a while, moved around, lived in West Africa, the upper Midwest and everything. Um, Somewhere in there, I was a journalist and a lawyer. And then one day I said, enough. I want to tell stories again. So I went back to school and got my MFA, and then my life turned kind of magical, and now here I am. Wow. It's quite a journey. So, <laughs> so, so, so writing's your passion then, right? If you had the success of uh, going to law school, especially prestigious places like universities like Harvard and Duke, it, it brought you back to writing. It's very interesting. So it's just something that you say to yourself, writing is what I do, right? That's yes. yes, I think, like, you know, our our culture and our country likes to tell young people that you can't make a sustainable life in the arts, but the truth is you neither have to starve nor be Beyonce, you know, there are a lot of people who are making a life in the arts, um, they're finding ways to sort of carve out a niche, and I, I, I like to tell, whenever I speak to young people, I always Tell them, you know, I one of the reasons I went back to get my MFA is that I was living with a woman who was an actress, and um, she was she was just as happy as a lark, and you know, I was following this path that had been prescribed by people who kind of didn't understand just how many ways there are to make a life in the arts, um, and so she she kind of inspired me to to get back to what I love to do. Um, so I feel very fortunate that 
you know, I, 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 cause a lot of this has been like sort of luck and, and, um, also I'm, I'm a pretty stubborn person. Uh, so once I made that decision, there was no, there was no looking back. Well, fascinating to say the least for sure. And it's just something that, uh, is interesting. So let's talk about why you wrote St. Monkey. Sure. Um, I think I didn't know actually until I got to the end of the first draft how much of this book was about my relationship with my father. Um, we, ha- we had a, had and have a really kind of interesting, uh, one of those really interesting parent-child relationships. And so the book kind of, um, I think, anchored my psyche as a story about a, a, a young woman who's trying to fulfill um, her father's unfulfilled destiny she's trying to leave town she's trying to leave this rural town because he although he did he he did so unsuccessfully um so that's sort of her quest and then the story about the friendship between um two girls and and how that survived sort of entered my psyche much much later um but i think you know to the extent that it is about what's happening to this friendship it's it's about it's also about at the same time it's about what happens to one young woman who is constrained by time and place um you know and we're talking about 50s rural kentucky and these these girls are both african american so not only are they women but they're black and they're discriminated against on both fronts they're very their roles are very prescribed in the society um, but when one friend leaves, um, and this is the, the friend who is a brilliant pianist, and she goes to New York um, to try to enter into the jazz world, in some ways she bumps up against the same constraints. Um, one thing that I, I did a lot of research for the book, um, and one layer of research I did was just to look up photographs and magazines from this time period. And one that just stuck with me and I couldn't shake was a photograph you guys may know called um, A Great Day in Harlem. It's about, um, it's, the, it's the photograph of 58 jazz greats on the steps of a brownstone in Harlem. And so there are only four women in that picture, and they're huddled together as they, <laughs> as though they need to sort of like, um, you know, hug each other. Um, it's interesting. So that photograph kind of stuck with me as I was thinking about Audrey's story. Eric, and, and it's interesting to talk about, again, music as something that uh, helped – in this story as well, uh, change people's lives, right, Eric? Well, yeah, it does. And I really think it's interesting that, you know, it's always sad when we hear about, you know, racism and, and, and segregation, all these things, you know, that hopefully as a, as a country or as a society, we can overcome and, Mm -hmm. and move past. And we've made great progress in that direction, but there's still a lot to do. And I think telling these stories really impact that, you know, and really kind of open people's eyes because I think a lot of these stories have just never really been told. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people are just unaware of these things that have, have occurred, you know, in our yes. culture. Yes, yes, and I and I did too. Um, I I wanted to write about a, a time and a place that hasn't, in some ways, has not been documented, and that's um, the part of Eastern Kentucky that we now call Appalachia. Um, so there there were these towns that um, were founded by freed slaves who were sort of, they were hired to take care of the horses in horse country. Um, And there was a ring of them around Lexington, Kentucky. There were eight towns. Um, And, you know, it's it's only recently, like in the last 10 to 15 years, that these towns have begun to just completely disappear as their residents die. And the young people, you know, they don't want to live there anymore. Um, So I wanted to document document this, um, you know, the way these people lived, the way they talked, um, their customs, uh, the, their ways of sort of like, you know, living living on the land. Um, so in some ways it was a love letter to people who, um, and I interviewed um, a lot of people who had lived in Kentucky and been that age at that time. So in a lot of ways it was a love letter to them and it was a love letter to that, that time and that, that place. Um, 
So there is a little bit of documentation in it. Yes. Indeed. How's How's the response been for the book? Have you gotten like positive feedback or anybody getting your comments or wanting to write yeah. another story? Yeah, some of the um, some of the just most touching moments I've had are, are in some ways a, a kind of emotional response to that. Um, so I had a number of people tell me that they they couldn't they didn't know how I could possibly know certain things. Um, like one one detail, I spent I spent an entire day in New York coming up with this detail that turned into two sentences. But um, but the seats in the Apollo were yellow and they were leather. Um, you know, that came from an interview with a, a, a man who had been a kid and he had hung around the Apollo and he gave me ideas for who had been, like the the jazz musicians that made cameo appearances in the book are, are people who came, you know, sort of directly from him. Um, my dad actually, and I, I, I know I had told you um when we when we first started talking, this this book was in some ways about my relationship with my dad. Um, right. My dad was just shocked because there is one chapter about a guy who goes to an Air Force base, and he decides in the face of that sort of discrimination, he goes to Alabama, and and he decides he's just never going to leave. My dad actually did that, but he didn't know that I knew that, and he also didn't know that I knew all these details about his time at the Air Force Base. Um, so that I mean, and you know, I have these I have these old men who will come up to me at a reading and and talk to me about the seats and the Merc, and you know, it's <laughs> it's been just. It's been some of the most gratifying um, criticism, if you will, that I've gotten, um, or critical critical acclaim, even that that people, you know, people who had lived through that era really felt that I had recreated it. Um, so I've been very very happy that I was able to to do that. That's exciting. I mean, it really is exciting to be able to pass that along and, and educate people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It definitely is, and, and uh, what are your, your your plans? Have you gone out and done, done a lot of talks regarding the subject of jazz and the book and all that? What is, what is your plan of how you're promoting the book? Well, um, fortunately, not. I don't. I don't get many questions about the book, which is probably a good thing because <laughs> because my relation to music is that I just love it and I am very bad at um producing it. So I you know, this this girl I, I I I think in some ways we often write about people we wish to be, you know, and so I'm I am that girl who would never practice piano ever. Um <laughs> and and so, you know, when people start talking about um the sort of the the technical musical aspects of this book um sometimes you know in in my head i i panic a little bit because um i feel like a lot of the writing i did that was about music particularly instruments i don't know i'm not even i don't even play um i kind of depended on a very glancing relationship with the research on that you know so there's a um there's a character and he's a he's a really prominent character in the book and he plays the violin um and i just kind of i i actually modeled some of my writing on that after liner notes um knowing that probably a lot of those people don't actually play those instruments either and I and I would say to myself, you know, if you were writing the liner notes about this guy, what would you write? Um, so I, you know, it's it's been a relief. No one has. I, apparently, I didn't get anything wrong, um, but it's it's kind of a relief that no one asked me about, too much about the music. <laughs> gotcha. All right, Shisenda, I appreciate you coming on the show. Where's the best place we can find information on you and purchase your book? Where can we go? Sure, I have a website, JacindaTownsend.com, J-A-C-I-N-D-A-T-O-W-N-S-E-N-D.com. It has been right, well, such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. You're Likewise. welcome. We enjoyed your conversation, the story, and I think it's also a great story uh, for um, 
children out there that they can go after their dreams and their goals. And uh, if they know if they enjoy music, even if it seems like other people around them aren't as interested in it, pursue their dreams and their hopes, just like you did, and left, uh, I guess, the law profession in certain ways to, be, to, to your passion, which is writing. And that's the important thing. Follow your passions. You'll be happy with life. If you choose a path that just really doesn't seem like your path, you're going to be miserable. So you're definitely telling a story. So thanks again for calling. Very true. Well, thank you. All right, take care. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. You're listening to Author's Corner, powered by Life Improvement Radio on the Toll Education Network, and we'll be back in just a moment. Thank you for listening to Life Improvement Radio. The views expressed by show hosts or their guests are their own and shall not be construed in any way as advice from Life Improvement Radio. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our website. Personal perspectives expressed by the producers, writers, or editors will always be presented as such. Any rebroadcast or retransmission without the expressed written consent of Life Improvement Radio is strictly prohibited. Thanks for listening.